All right, we will return to John chapter 14. Gospel of John chapter 14. We'll read verses 1 through 24. Let's hear the word of the Lord once more. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father." And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. May God once more bless the reading of his holy word. Let's go before him in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your condescension to love us sinners. We thank you for the gift of your Son, for the gift of your Spirit. We thank you for making a home in us, your people. We thank you for saving us by your grace. Pray that you would make us to walk in all the commandments of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That you would fill us with the spirit of truth. That we may be enabled to give you the glory you are due. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So we left off at verse 14. Uh, Beloved, would you bring me my water, please? It's there on the back pew. Thank you. We left off at verse 14. We'll pick up in verse 15. And as we've seen through this chapter so far, that Jesus has been and will continue to declare His great love for His disciples. We've seen that in that He told them He goes to prepare an eternal dwelling place in paradise 
for them. We've seen it as he tells them he is entrusting them to the tender loving care of his father while he goes to bear the wrath of the father in their place. He has also told and demonstrated how the disciples are to love one another. We remember back in chapter 13 when Jesus girded himself and washed the feet of the disciples and then said, you are to do likewise. In verse 15, I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. They ought to, they ought to care for the needs of others in humility. And then... Now, Jesus now turns in our verse for today, verse 14. We're actually going to look at several, but we'll begin in verse 15. Thank you, dear. Verse 15 is, if you love me, keep my commandments. So Jesus now turns to how his disciples may show love to him. So again, he's declared his own love to them, showed how he loves them and they're to love one another. And now he turns it, this is how you love me. We know what men expect their Creator requires of them in order to show that they love Him. He has given us His Word that we can follow, His commandments. And men know intuitively around the world that they ought to show reverence, show love, if you will, to uh, their creator, to the, the higher power, the higher being that is out there. And so we see that in false uh, religions. They, they attempt to show devotion, that they love the creator by doing what they believe it is that he wants them to do. What Jesus asks is nothing like the false religions that are logically inconsistent, self-destructive, and uh, lead only to death, those ways that seem right to a man. What Jesus asks is that we keep his commandments. We think, wow, this is a, this is a you know, massive undertaking. Well, John didn't seem to think so in his first epistle. He said his commandments are not burdensome. They can be summed up as simply love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, the two tables of the law that the, the, the kids have been working through in catechism. They're not burdensome because the Christian loves the commands of God. They love them because they reflect the absolutely holy and morally pure character of God. When your heart is full of love for someone, you are all too glad to do what they ask. A child loves their parents. They're glad to be given something to do by their parent that they love. You have peers that you love. You're glad to do what they ask you to do. Sometimes it's a stupid dare and you shouldn't do it. But we typically are, are, are all too glad to do what, what we can for them. Do what they desire, what they ask of you. And this, Jesus makes this request here. If you love me, keep my commandments. The problem with us is not that God's commandments are hard to understand. They're not. They're relatively straightforward. It's not that they bring misery on society so that we groan and grumble as we have to keep them because it just, it just tears society down. Quite the contrary. The problem is that our hearts are not full of love for God. That, therein lies the problem. But there is someone that helps us with that. We're going to get into that today. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love, it's the uh, Greek present active subjunctive, subjunctive being mode of possibility, probability. If you love me, this will be indicative of you. And the keep, the verb there is, is a Greek future active indicative. It may be better rendered, you will keep. This will be indicative of someone who loves me. They will be someone keeping my commandments. And... I've been trying to work outlines into my sermon. I may have done overkill today. We have two outlines. We have one outline for just verse 15, and then 16 and 17 get their separate outline. But here's just an outline to consider for this short verse, verse 15. Point number one is simply, if it is love, it will be more than words. 
I don't know of a relationship this isn't true of. That if you love someone, it's going to be more than words. A lot of times we kind of wish or hope we could reduce it to just words and thereby fulfill our obligation. My infant son wouldn't last very long if that was the case. If I just told him how much I loved him, didn't make sure he was taken care of, he would very quickly perish. Love has to be more than just words. You, you, men, you can tell your wife you love her with all the poetic flair of Shakespeare. You can master you know, art in the Bible and tell her with all the highest words and all the languages how much you love her. You can write her cards in the mail. You can learn ten instruments and sing songs to her about how wonderful she is. She's still going to want you to do stuff. She still wants you to do things to demonstrate your love. If such a professed love is not demonstrated in action, she is not going to love it for long. She wants more than just words, and that's good. We should want, we should demonstrate love, want our love to be more than just words. Nothing wrong with words in their place. But if it's love, it will move beyond the words. There will be something behind them. She wants you to do things for her. Poems and songs, they're fine and well. Uh, but it rings hollow. There needs to be something behind it. She wants you to maybe rub her feet or vacuum that floor. But honey, put your guitar down. You've serenaded me long enough. Get over here and sweep. Get over here and clean this. Uh, fix that broken shelf. Move this heavy box. You know, kill that bug. She wants you to demonstrate your love, in a, and there's a thousand more, maybe, maybe a thousand's underestimating, but there's all these other ways you can demonstrate your love in action. So you get the idea. God Himself has not just declared His love for His creatures. We understand this intuitively, practically, experientially. God has not just said wonderful things about how He loved us and then left us to perish in our sins. He did something about it. 2,000 years ago, His Son hung on the cross and He crushed Him under His wrath to demonstrate His love. Notwithstanding all of the common grace of God, notwithstanding all of the other blessings that He has poured upon us that, that flow from the love of God, ultimately demonstrated in the death of Christ. We've been giving that as the most loving demonstration that ever has been, could be, or will be is the cross of Jesus Christ. That will never be topped. All of the love we have for each other mounted together would be a crumb next to a mountain if we're quantifying love, the love of the cross. And so Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Let's move back to the context for a minute. So he's telling his disciples on the night he's going to be betrayed how they are to love him. Jesus doesn't just want you to mourn at the foot of the cross. Don't just be sad that he's dying. And he hangs there, oh no, if only we'd have done this. If you love me, keep my commandments. Because his words are going to abide forever. Jesus is going to die on the cross. Three days, three nights in the tomb, he's going to come out. And then he's going to be 40 days with his uh, disciples, believers, and he's going to go into glory. But his words will remain. Heaven and earth will pass away. His words will not pass away. Matthew 23, 35. And so these words that he's leaving are the words for them to follow. This is how you're going to love me. We don't need a great morning vigil at the cross. There were some that mourned. They followed their Savior. But that's not the supreme display of love he's seeking. Countless funerals have featured twofold mourners. Those who mourn the loss of their loved ones. And they also mourn because all opportunities to fulfill the desires of that loved one have now ceased to. They will never see them come to fruition. So I encourage you, it may seem trite, but let your love be more than words. Don't just tell the, be sure to tell the people you love that you love them and then demonstrate it. Spend your life demonstrating it. And so, nor is Jesus sacrificial, nor is dying sacrificially for Jesus the, dis, the supreme display of love he is seeking. If I was better at English, these sermons would be easier. Jesus doesn't want them to just die sacrificially for him. I'm thinking about Peter at the end of chapter 13 there. When Peter says, Lord, why can I not follow you? I'll lay down my life for you. Here's Peter professing his love for Jesus. I'll lay down my life for you, Jesus. That's not the kind of love Jesus wants. 
Don't just lay yourself down as some kind of martyr on the railroad tracks. Lay down your desires, lay down your wants, and keep the commandments of God. That's what He asks. We don't need a great bleeding display. We have that in the cross. It is the, the prerogative of God alone to determine how many breaths I breathe. You know, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, doesn't just refer to other people around you, it refers to you too. And so we are to leave that to the hands of God. But while we're alive, verse 15, keep my commandments if you love me. He doesn't need me to terminate my life as any kind of sacrifice. God has made His own sacrifice for sin. The sacrifice He calls us to make is not by dying, but by living for righteousness. Romans 12.1 that we're, we're coming up on. We're to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that look like? Love me, keep my commandments. That's exactly what that looks like. Keep my commandments, says Jesus. Jesus is the sacrifice for sin as He dies. We are the sacrifice to God as we live. Live unto righteousness. Live to keep His commandments. To walk in the ways that He walked. Jesus doesn't want weeping and wailing unless it's rending your hearts over sin. We get back to a place of obedience. Lord, turn me and I shall be turned. He doesn't want you to terminate your physical life. No, He's put you on this earth to live for Him. Not to destroy yourself as some kind of sacrifice for Him. He wants obedience, not sacrifice. This is true of God in the Old Testament. Remember? Remember Samuel? When Saul spared Agag and the best of the flocks and said, well, you know, we, we were only going to offer them as a sacrifice for the Lord. And Samuel turns to him and says, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings as he has in obedience? Rhetorical question. He doesn't want you to save stuff for him, Saul. He wants you to love him and keep his commandments. And his commandment to Saul through direct revelation was wipe them out. Devote them to destruction. Don't save Agag. Don't save these creatures over here. Wipe them out. That's kind of harsh. If you love him, keep his commandments. Saul didn't want to do it. And so the Lord left him. God has always wanted obedience over sacrifice. And, you know, we may not know, we may not have direct revelation, we don't have direct revelation as Saul did, and we may not know specifics about what God's will is for our lives. I struggle with this too. But there's no time to complain about that. We have enough of His revealed will we can get to obeying and leave the secret stuff up to God. So what are Jesus' commandments? Well, we've seen in John what He expects us to do, His life. Think especially of the Sermon on the Mount. There's plenty of clear commandments there. In the Sermon on the Mount, commandments too clear. So clear, we know exactly what they mean and don't want to keep them. Things like loving your enemies. Ooh, that's the hard stuff of religion. You know, it's not um, trying to understand the hypostatic union. It's loving your enemies. That's the hard stuff. Lord help us. So we have the, the Sermon on the Mount. We have... Um, the whole Gospels that teach us the life of Christ. And Christ treasured the law. Not one jot or tittle was going to pass away from the law. Obviously, the ceremonial has been superseded in Jesus Christ. It has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And to go back and try to reinstitute some of that would be blasphemous, would be idolatry. Make a mockery of Christ. We think of commands to repent and believe the Gospel. When Jesus started His ministry in Mark's Gospel, Mark 1.15, what are the first words out of Jesus' mouth publicly? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the Gospel. There's the command. There's the first command. We have to nail that one down first. We have to have life from above if we're ever going to live a life like that which is above. We have to be filled with the Spirit of God. And so simply summing up this first point of the outline, if you love Jesus, you'll imitate Jesus. Again, we, we imitate those whom we love. The people that you look up to and respect, you, you eventually end up sounding like them. You eventually end up doing things like they do. Their interests become your interests. 
You think about what would they do in this situation. Some of these things can be um, dangerous, depending on who you're, you're, you're looking up to. We have to remember always, only imitate man as far as they imitate God. Any further and you're on sinking sand. But if you love Jesus, you will imitate Jesus. You will talk like He talked. His words will be in your mouth. You will live like He lived and how He cared for others, how He spent His time. Retreating to the mountaintop to pray oftentimes. You will treasure the thing that He treasures. Fellowship with His people. The Word of God. The worship of God. The laws that governed His life will govern yours. We will want that if we love Jesus Christ. Every word that proceeds out of His mouth are the words we are to live by. Second point of this, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's hard to get past, I believe, the fact that Jesus demands the same fidelity as God did with Old Covenant Israel. I think some of that is, is, is here. We remember when God chose Israel and redeemed Israel from slavery to worship Him and to love Him, brought, brought Israel out of Egypt, chose Israel, elected Israel if you want to say, to be His people and then brought them out of Egypt they would show their love to God by keeping His commandments when God made a covenant with them. Mount Sinai. They would show their love to Him, show covenant solidarity with Him by keeping His commandments. And failure to do so would result in spiritual death. And that's why all men have perished, is because none have kept the covenant until the Son. And so here Jesus chose His disciples... He has redeemed them for Himself. And now He tells them, if you would love Him, keep my commandments. It's hard to miss those parallels with Yahweh in the Old Testament. I think we got claims to deity here. Jesus can claim that. He can claim to keep my word. Of course, His word is in perfect harmony with the law of God. Because He's one with the Father. Distinct from the Father, but one with the Father. Same holy nature. So it's hard to miss that this is another claim to deity. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That was the essence of the old covenant. It's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Third, I think, we we can draw from this text, is that the, the great promises of prayer that Jesus has just been speaking on, verses 12 through 14, are only available to those who love God, to those who keep His commandments. It's idolatrous to suppose that God is bound to give whatever, give us whatever we ask when we will not give Him the obedience that He asks for. He has a right to make claims on us. We, we have no right to make any claim on God. We have only, He tells me here to ask for this, so I ask for this. Ask whatever we read in 1 John 5, whatever He asks, tells us to ask for according to His will, He gives us that. And so, these promises of prayer for those who love Him, for those who ask things according to His commandments, according to His revealed will. We are the creature. He is the Creator. It's our duty to do all that He tells us. God is not our cosmic servant to do whatever we would like Him to do for us. He he only does that which glorifies His Son. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. How is the Son glorified? When you love Him and keep His commandments. And fourth and finally on verse 15, this obedience, of course, would only be possible by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Apart from the Holy Spirit indwelling us, we are um, careening down a path of destruction. Those who do not know the Spirit or have the Spirit are the ones who will perish in their sins. That will not go to the place where Jesus is. Apart from the quickening work of the Spirit, we are dead in sins and trespasses. And this, of course, described the majority of Old Covenant Israel. 
there were a few there that had the Spirit of God in them. Abraham did, and Moses did, and there are others that had the, the Spirit of God in them. But almost all of the, the people of God in the Old Covenant, that is ethnic, national Israel, they did not have the Spirit of God. They were unbelievers, which is manifest in their constant re- breaking of the covenant. Repeatedly breaking the covenant. And it's not that Jesus is saying um, in these coming verses that he's giving the Spirit because the Spirit was completely absent from the Old Testament. We're two verses into Genesis and the Holy Spirit is already on the scene. So it's not that the Holy Spirit is somehow you know, missing, you know, missing in action or anything like that. No, he's present. But there's what's going to come now in the, the, the history of redemption following the cross at Pentecost is going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit such as has never been seen before, which is a distinctly new covenant blessing that Joel prophesied of. That God's going to pour down the Holy Spirit in great abundance. Joel 2. Maybe probably the most famous passage from Joel. One of the minor prophets. Turn too fast, we'll go right by them. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Joel 2 in verse 28. Here's some new covenant language from God's servant Joel. Joel 2.28 And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Oh, there's a remnant being called. There's a remnant. The Spirit is being poured out upon. And this is why in Jeremiah 31 under the New Covenant, we're not going to have to tell any, anyone in the family of God, among the people of God, know the Lord, brother. They're a brother because they know the Lord. They're not physically the people of God, spiritually the people of God. Spiritually the people of God precisely because they have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. The people of God in the New Covenant have the Holy Spirit within them as a down payment for the salvation that will be completed in them. If we turn over to Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. Verse 13 of Ephesians 1, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee, the Greek word there for down payment, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. So all God's people in the New Covenant keep His commandments. Not perfectly, of course not. There's not a Christian that doesn't uh, sin multiple times every day. But what do we do when we sin? We acknowledge it. We confess it. We repent it. We repent of it. We flee to Christ for gospel grace and cleansing, and He sets us right back into walking His ways again. And so, summarizing verse 15, where there's no obedience, you can be sure there's no salvation. Again, not talking about a sinless perfection here. Salvation doesn't mean never sin again, but there's going to be a consistent track of obedience. There's going to be a love for Jesus, a desire to keep His commandments. That's why it hurts when sin is committed. That's why the relationship with God needs to be restored through repentance, through turning from sin. 
part of what it means to obey. But where the root is alive, where the soul has been saved, there will always be fruit. There will be fruit of the Spirit. Let's turn now to verses 16 and 17. We read, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper. We'll go ahead and pause there for a second. I will pray the Father. Let's think about this for just a moment. I will pray the Father, says Jesus. Why does, he, why does He say, I will pray the Father? Does He not have power to command the Spirit? Sure He does. Sure He does. Um, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity works together. So we may ask, why is Jesus saying, I'll pray the Father? Well, because all along through His ministry, everything He's done has been according to the will of His Father for His life. Even the giving of the best of donations to His disciples. I will pray the Father. And He will give you another Helper. I mean, these promises are so great, they're almost no way to fully exhaust or comprehend the greatness within. But I've got a six-point outline to try to help us understand verses 16 through 17. So when Jesus says, I will pray the Father and He will give you another Helper. First point I'd like us to consider is that the Spirit is a gift from the Father through the Son. The Spirit's a gift. I, I like that phrase, best of all donations. It was in that last hymn we, we sang. One of the first mediatorial acts of Jesus Christ was to pray for the Spirit to come to His disciples. You know, I, reading through the life of Christ in the Gospels, there's only one thing we're told that Jesus was impressed with, and that was what? Great faith. Exactly, great faith. But there's trying to read into the emotions of Jesus Christ can be dangerous. But I think one thing that is warranted is the excitement that Jesus had to give the Spirit to His disciples. Now, why do I think that's warranted? Because for the next three chapters, it's going to come up over and over and over again. And I know you're not going to get tired of it, my brothers and sisters. Why? Because you live with the Spirit every day. So we never get tired of hearing about the Holy Spirit and His ministry toward us. It should warm our hearts every mention. Every mention of, of that other helper that has come. So the first thing is that He is a gift. I will pray the Father and He will give you. How does Jesus know that? Because the Trinity are working together. The Father's ready to give. The Spirit's ready to come. And the Son prays, He is sent. He's a gift. And so here we see, you know, the Son has taught us back in 12, 13, and 14, uh, verses 12, 13, and 14 of chapter 14, what we ought to pray for. Here we see what the Son is praying for. So to walk like Jesus walked, here's one thing we can pray for too. Lord, give me a greater measure of your Spirit. Yes, we can say certainly that He dwells in us. We can pray, Lord, more of Your Spirit. Help me to quench Him less. Spirit, teach me. Make me to understand this Word that You've inspired. Make me to see Christ therein, the living Word revealed in the written Word. We can pray for the Spirit to come. Rend the heavens and come down, O Spirit. And we also see in this text the Trinity. Pastor Little had a Trinitarian text this morning. I've got one for you this afternoon too. Jesus says, and I, there's the Son, speaking in the first person, will pray the Father, there's another member of the Trinity, and He will give you another Helper. There's the Spirit. There's another Trinitarian text that we, that we see. All three members present here. And this, the second point of the outline that I want us to, to, to get is that this special gift is a person. This isn't something material. It's a person, albeit the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have a corporeal body like we do. He's the Holy Spirit. But it's a person. The Spirit is not some impersonal force. Not some kind of um, divine wind. He's a person. 
as much as the Father and the Son. He's a person. That He may abide. Bibles ought never to refer to the Spirit as it. It's a He. It's a person. The Spirit is anything but impersonal. If there's anything personal, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, let's understand that the Spirit is a person. I will pray the Father, He will give you another helper. We're going to come back to that in just a minute, but I want us to stop on that phrase, that He may abide. It's a person that's being given. The Son was given, yes. The Spirit is given too. It's all given, brothers and sisters. We didn't merit any of it. But it's a He, it's a person that's coming. He's not a divine static. He's not energy. A person. Every bit as much a person as the Father and the Son. Every bit as much God as the Father and the Son. He's not some third class deity. Oh no. Let us not think lightly of the Spirit. The, the third point that I want us to consider is that phrase, another helper. That we've seen that the, the Spirit is a gift. The Spirit as point one. The Spirit is a person, point two. Point three, the Holy Spirit helps in all the ways Jesus helped the disciples. Like keeping the commandments of God. And this is one of the, the first names that we see of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. Parakletos is the, the Greek uh, term there. Comes from, it's a compound uh, word. comes from uh, para, the Greek preposition that means with or alongside, by. And then uh, the verb uh, kaleo, the second half of that uh, compound word, is Greek verb kaleo, which means to call. So... Another helper is one literally in the Greek called alongside. And we would say it's translated helper because he's called alongside to do what? To help. Kind of a general term because of the great ministry of the Holy Spirit to the the beloved, to the disciples of Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit is one called alongside to help. Number three... And this, of course, would be immensely comforting to the disciples. Remember, we don't want to lose sight of our context. The disciples are thinking, oh no, Jesus is getting ready to leave us. We followed him the last three years of our life. It appears it's all been for nothing because he's speaking all morbidly about how he's about to die. And what are we going to do? You're going to wait till he sends that other comforter. And you're going to be filled with power from on high. And the same Holy Spirit that fell on them is in every one of us too. Not manifested in all the same ways. None of y'all have ever spoken in tongues. But the Spirit, the same Spirit lives in us, makes us to believe in the same gospel, same Jesus, because He is the Spirit of truth. Getting a little ahead of myself there, verse 17. But He's another helper. Another helper. One who's going to come alongside them, be every bit as close to them as Jesus was, closer in some sense. Because we, we have the preposition there, at the end of verse 17, is going to be in you. In all of Jesus' disciples, that, that was not true at all while Jesus roamed the earth for three years. Had disciples different places, that he, some he could be with, some he couldn't. When he's at Martha and Mary and Lazarus' house, he's not at Peter's house. But in the New Covenant... After the Spirit has come, He's in every single one of Jesus Christ's disciples. Point number four is uh, and that He may abide with you forever. Again, I don't want to pass over that too quickly. The comfort just keeps coming. Jesus has been with them three years. The Holy Spirit will be with them for all time. You know, that's actually one of the best things about the Holy Spirit. He's the only person you never say goodbye to. Because once you're born again by Him, He inhabits you forever. Oh, you may quench Him. You may grieve Him. It may feel as if He's far off. Not because He moved, because 
of our sin. Isaiah 59, 2. Our sins have made a separation. But the Holy Spirit is someone you never say goodbye to. He is in the people of God from the moment He regenerates them. He is in them for all time. And I'm not just talking about in them because God is not displaced by material things. I'm not just talking about the, in the um, omnipresence of God. When He says in you, in you to help you in you. In you to lead you in the truth in you. He will abide with you forever. We never have to say goodbye to the Holy Spirit. That's a helper. Sometimes you're, you're, you're in the hospital with somebody that's ill and your helpers have to leave and go home because they're tired too and they need, they need food and you have to say goodbye to your help. You hire somebody for a time to watch your child or your aging parent and you have to say goodbye to them and say, oh, I'm losing my help. Not this helper. With you forever. And you don't have to pay him either. You just... Love Him and keep His commandments. With you forever. Point number four is that He is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. Also, again, important in our context. We just heard the term truth. Verse 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This is now the Spirit of truth. Well, again, because He shares in the divine nature with the Son. Who shares in the divine nature with the Father. Who shares in the divine nature with the Spirit ad infinitum. They all have the same nature. And so He's the Spirit of truth also. Every bit as divine as the Father and the Son. And He comes to... He's the Spirit of truth because He testifies to the One who is the way and the truth and the life. That's the Holy Spirit's job is to testify to Jesus Christ. He comes to minister the truth about Jesus Christ. So where the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, we pray for the Holy Spirit to take that up. Glorify the Son, O Spirit. Make, make us to understand more of Him, to, to, to revel more in His glory, to believe more strongly in His gospel, to live more devotedly to Him and as we love Him and keep His commandments. Make our hearts to abound with love, for Him. He's the Spirit of truth. It, 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 you know, it's ironic, it, tragically ironic, that so many churches today that claim to be Spirit-filled or that emphasize the Holy Spirit and then do all these wild and crazy things, some of which don't even need to be mentioned, repeated, and they claim they're doing it in the name of the Spirit, they're actually the most blasphemous of the Holy Spirit. That's out there. He's the spirit of truth. All these lies and deception and mockery and, and nonsense doesn't belong to him. That's not his ministry. To make people run themselves into walls and, 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 and babble nonsense. It's not the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He has no part in that. There might be another spirit that does. It might be a demonic spirit. But that's not the Holy Spirit. That's not His ministry. His ministry is one of truth. He testifies to the one who is the truth, Jesus Christ. And so any, any church that's not teaching the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a Spirit-filled church. They can't hope to be. You have to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, set forth His commandments, set forth Him in all His glory if you would have the Spirit come and own that ministry and make it to abound and prosper unto the glory of God. The, the Father eagerly awaited the day, and I say awaited. God doesn't really wait on anything. It's all the eternal present with God, but uh, because I, I, uh, I have the English language and I'm a mere mortal, I have to uh, use some of these terms to uh, convey the message. But the Father was glad, we'll say, to send His Son. Glad for the day when His Son would come into the world to accomplish His role in the glory of redemption. When after 4,000 years of sin, the Son finally is on the scene. No more prophesying that He's going to come. No more signs and symbols telling us what He'll be like. When He comes, He comes. And He's on the scene. And He's here. God's theater we have beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the Son's on the scene. And the Son 
is now eager to send the Spirit to accomplish His role in the history of redemption. This isn't the Father, oh, I'm tired of this here, have it, Son. This isn't the Son, oh, I'm tired of this, have it, Spirit. No, they're working together for the glory of their own great name, the great name of God. They're working together, God, the three members of the Godhead, the Trinity, to bring glory to Himself, to save His people for Himself, And the Son is glad to send the Spirit, the Spirit of truth. That's going to be His role in the history of redemption. He's going to take the gospel where it's preached and make it to prosper. That the Word will not return void. Because He's the Spirit of truth. He's given us a whole book of truth. He inspired it. He inspired all the men over a period of 1,500 years to write this book. He's the Spirit of truth. And he's been faithful to fulfill his role for millennia. We can rejoice in the Holy Spirit. His glory is not sung enough. You know, you look at the hymns in our own hymn book. The Holy Spirit gets a few pages. Father and Son get plenty. Holy Spirit's not praised enough for his faithfulness to the people of God. And then fifth and finally, not finally, sixth is finally, but fifth, The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. Churches that don't teach the way, the truth, and the life cannot do so because they don't have the Spirit of God. They're going to teach something else. That's how we know they're not a Spirit-filled church. We can move right along. They're worldly. So the Holy Spirit's not seen by them or known by them. You know, isn't it interesting? He's, he's called the Holy Spirit, and you think, well, you know, Spirit is not something you see. So how is Jesus saying now, it neither sees Him? Well, nobody sees the Spirit, Jesus. What do you mean? Brothers and sisters, when I see you walking in the ways of the commandments of God, I see the Holy Spirit at work. You wouldn't be doing that if the Spirit wasn't at work in you. So we see the Spirit moving among us. And we ought to pray for more of it, desire more of it, thank God for what we see of it. So we see the Spirit in that way. John, back in John 3, he told Nicodemus, he's like the wind that blows. You don't, you don't see where he's coming and going. But the thing about wind is, you might not see it coming, but after it's blown through, you know it. And so we could tell where the Spirit has regenerated someone, that they now live to love Jesus and keep His commandments. And we know the Spirit's been there. That's His footprint, as it were. Do spirits leave footprints? Well, I guess you could say He does in that way. But if the Jews in Jesus' time, they didn't receive the Spirit. They didn't see Him nor know Him. The Son was right before them in the flesh and they didn't know who He was. They're certainly not going to get the Spirit. They didn't know the Spirit because they, they didn't realize who the first comforter was, the first helper was. They're not going to get the other helper that's going to come. They didn't realize... Who the Spirit, this other helper, would be like, Jesus Christ. They, they, didn't know, they didn't comprehend who He was. The world cannot receive. And again, it's not, a, it's not that the world may not receive Him. As if the Lord says, well, you just lack permission. It's that we cannot. Don't have access. Unless the Son prays the Father and we receive the Spirit. All the Father gives to me will come to me. How do they come? By the Holy Spirit. But contrary to the world, point six, Christians are intimately acquainted with the Holy Spirit. Very intimately. The language Jesus uses, you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. It's almost like it goes up a degree when you know somebody that's good, you know somebody that you, you love, you know them, that's good. When they're with you, that's even better. When they're in you, we can't comprehend that as humans, but the Spirit dwelling in us. It's not just knowing Him, not just being with Him. He will be in you. He dwells with you, will be in you. We're going to come to some very sacred ground in verse 20. Jesus says, I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. 
I'm, I'm trembling just thinking about how I want to preach that verse. Y'all can, y'all can pray for the Spirit to fall on me. <laughs> preach through these, these great mysteries. But He will be in you. Now the Holy Spirit will be in Jesus' disciples. Jesus said all along, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and now the Holy Spirit sent from the Father and myself is going to be in you. You know, the idea of God being far off from us. I think texts like this just blow that notion completely away. Well, God, he just, he, he's, he's so transcendent. He doesn't want to be anywhere near us. He's so holy, He doesn't want anything to do with us. We'll be in you. Kind of hard to get closer than that. To be inhabited by the divine. Because again, like we heard in the Sunday school hour, He didn't just redeem our souls. He redeemed our bodies too. And so these bodies become temples of the Most High God. That we can then live out the character of God in this earth. What does it mean to live out the character of God in this earth? Verse 15. Keep my commandments. The problem is that not that God distances Himself from us. That's not the problem. The problem is we don't want Him. We cannot receive Him. Unless He comes to us. Unless the the Son prays to the Father that the Spirit comes upon us. We can't receive Him. So again, with that access that you have, brothers and sisters, plead for the Spirit to come. To awaken dead sinners unto life. Because unless the Spirit does that, they are going to remain dead. Dead in sins and trespasses. And so because of His relation to the Father. And on the basis of His role as the mediator, Jesus will send them another helper, another comforter that will abide with them forever. He who dwells with you will be in you. Never have to tell Him goodbye. The world cannot receive them because... They're dead in their sins. They have no desire for a spirit of truth who would turn them from their sins. That's why they cannot receive Him. And so the presence or the absence of the Holy Spirit in you is what makes the difference between an eternal destiny knowing only the love of God or an eternal destiny knowing only the wrath of God. This is what it comes down to. Is the Holy Spirit in you? If He's not in you here, you won't be with Him in glory. You know, we considered some weeks back, or maybe it was months, I can't remember, Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. Everything was the same about those ten virgins. They got the same invitation to the same wedding. They were given the same duty to prepare for. Have these torches ready when the bridegroom comes. They knew what to do. The orders were the same. All that was the same. And yet only 50% of them, 5 out of 10, were prepared. One thing that made the difference was the oil that they had. So here in this life, we may have many things in common with other people. May on the outside look very religious. May appear to keep the commandments of God externally but if there's not the presence of the spirit within if you're not ready with the spirit of God to meet the bridegroom when he comes you will not spend an eternity with God knowing the love of God it will be knowing the wrath of God the unmitigated unreserved and undiminished Wrath of God. It's the Holy Spirit that makes the difference. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, plead with Him. Jesus, you, you plead with the Father for me, please. Give me the Holy Spirit, please. Make Him to come and live within me. Whatever He has to kick out the door to live in me, get it out. I need the Holy Spirit in me. Do you have the Holy Spirit living within you? Do you love Jesus? 
Do you keep His commandments out of love or because you want to appear like you have the Spirit? Don't deceive yourselves. Quit playing religious games and plead for the Spirit. His work is to minister the way, the truth, and the life to your soul. You need Him? Ask for Him in Jesus' name. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. There's something you can ask for. Well, how do I know I can ask for it? Jesus did. Your example did. Ask for the Spirit. He, his presence or His absence is going to seal your eternal destiny. Oh, Spirit, we need You. We need You in our midst. We need You to come to teach us, to fill us, to inhabit us, to, to motivate us to obedience, make us to run the way of the commandments of God. We need the Spirit. We love the Son. We can see very clearly what He does for us. But we have the Spirit in us who is exactly like the Jesus that prayed for Him to come. He's called another helper. Another because there was a first. That's Jesus. The Holy Spirit is just like Him. We have Him in us. Oh, that we would not quench Him, that we would have Him. If you don't have Him, plead with Him. Ask for Him in Jesus' name. Our Father and our God, we do ask that You would make us full of Your Spirit. That whatever ways we may be quenching Him, that if there's anything that we want more than Him, Lord, You would forgive us. That You would give to us a great hunger, a hunger greater than all others, to have more of the Spirit of God. Oh, Spirit, we pray that You would fill us, cause us to obey, to love You, that You would minister truth to our souls. Keep us from error, we pray. We thank you that you are with us forever. And because you are so glorious, we never tire of you. Oh, for the day. Oh, for the day. when we don't quench you anymore by our sin. Oh, we pray that you would help us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We'll close with a hymn together. Uh, this one's going to be number 447.